of the Big Both, both Ways? Yes. Yeah. I would love to. This is my seventh book. It's the first one that's not in the Cecil Younger series. I had a series of detective stories. And this, um, but this one will just set the stage. I'll read just a couple of paragraphs. Uh, it was May 1935. In April, Amelia Earhart had set a speed record on a solo flight, flight from Los Angeles to Mexico City. And when she took off again, she set another from Mexico City to New York. In the American Southwest, a blizzard of dust scoured the tired farmland, and the Roosevelt administration began relocating dust bowlers to communal farms in the territory of Alaska. In August, Will Rogers and Wiley Post were to set off in their Lockheed Orion for Point Barrow, and on June 24th, the miners of the Alaska Juno Gold Mine would riot when scabs started marching up the street to the hiring hall. All of these things would take on new meaning to Slippery Wilson in the months to come. But just then he was looking halfway up a big butted Douglas fir tree, listening to his bullbuck tell him something through a wad of chew. His given name was Jack, but his parents had called him Slippery. Like many people during the Depression, he wanted to be hopeful. Others had told him that life was hard, but he was not seen it that way. He had always been stubborn in his optimism, but now he was beginning to wonder. That's a very, very <laughs> provocative opening. It does make one wonder. <laughs> it sets, uh, it sets uh, the scene of, of the history, and, it, and there was a lot of history um, of, uh, in the Depression era in Alaska that uh, the Roosevelt administration had all kinds of plans for the territory. Um, they, they moved uh, dust bowlers from Oklahoma, Texas, that part of the world, up to these communal farms just, um, just outside of An the Anchorage area. Even there, though they weren't farmers? Well, they were, no, they were farmers. Oh, there oh, were a lot okay. of farmers from the, from the Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl. Mm -hmm. oh, all right. But of course, then they were in the, uh, the subarctic tundra. <laughs> right. Uh, where uh, it was there, there's some amazing stories that could come out of those <laughs> camps, and then of course the the famous um, uh, initiative put forward by the Roosevelt administration to open up all um, uh, immigration to the European Jews um, and into southeastern Alaska, which was taken by Michael Shabon in his book, The Yiddish Policeman's Union. Oh yes, yeah, he wrote he wrote. Uh, uh, alternative history of my little town of Sitka, Alaska. Yeah, I, I've read it. That yeah, book. it's a great book. Yeah, it is. Well, uh, that's a, a nice introduction to uh, you. There's another character in The Big Both Ways that mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about, and that's that's the little girl uh, oh, sure. who uh, uh, plays a part, plus her, her pet bird. Yeah. That seems like a, a sort of an unusual um, combination of people to be going up the in a rowboat especially a yeah uh, well well in writing mysteries and and I have a interest in sort of tough characters and and um, one of the things you're always trying to do in a book is is to have something at stake for the reader um, and so if you have too many kind of tough uh, violent kind of characters nobody you start losing interest in them that you don't really care if they get hurt or damaged anymore because they're kind of they're kind of deserving of whatever they get so you know it's it's always a great idea to uh, for tension in a book to have um, an innocent in there involved with all these wild ones and so in my story the this woman who is in deep trouble having mur uh, looks like she's murdered um, uh, a private detective um, she has a niece named Annabelle, and Annabelle is about 10 years old, and she has long braids and big thick glasses, and she is based almost completely, detail for detail, from my niece, <laughs> a little girl named uh, Rebecca Mostow, who lives up in Seattle, who loves animals and nature. And so I just, and uh, I put her, I wanted Rebecca in, in this story, uh, turned her into Annabelle and took her on this trip. And the, the little bird is a, this cockatiel you see on the cover. Um, he was one of our, we had a pet cockatiel. It was just was wild, crazy animal. And we weren't particularly suited to each other. <laughs> but I used to put him in, the, in his cage and give him a bath out on, the, out on the deck of our house, which is right out on the water and faces the North Pacific. And I'd, he'd be singing away and bathing. And then the eagles and the 
ravens would come down and sit on the picnic table and, and they'd look at this yellow bird and cock their heads and try to figure out what the heck this was. Yeah. And I just thought that was interesting. I love that detail. And, and I guess the truth be, after, even after I wrote the book, I figured out why I was drawn to it. And I think that that yellow bird was just as foreign in that wild, cold landscape of rock and rain as I am. Uh -huh. you know? And so he's just as foreign and just as vulnerable. And so uh, I said, all right, I'm going to put both of them on this dory trip to see, let them out of their cages and see what happens. Well, uh, Ed, do you care to tell people how the book ends? I mean, does it end on an up, up beat or, or <laughs> is it kind of a bad story? It is. They get awfully beat up on this trip. There's all kinds of problems and, and um, as, um, as the story go lo goes along, but I'm, I'm glad to say that that at the end everything works out pretty well and they end up in a little town of my own making called Cold Storage Alaska <laughs> which is uh, uh, the next book in this there's, this is actually hopefully going to be a series uh, based around this little town called Cold Storage Alaska so my next book will deal with the descendants of these people and uh, and my idea is to have a series based just on the mood and the atmosphere and the strange characters that would live in this remote little village. <laughs>